Hello, welcome to the Comic Book Club. I am your host, Jamil Payne. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Amanda Coney. How are you doing, Amanda? I'm doing great. So, Amanda, we are reading Through the Woods today by Emily Carroll. But before we get to that, um, as you know, last last show was our, was our anniversary show. And we didn't get a chance to really talk about the show and, and what it means to us as the people that create it. Because we had so much um, Comic-Con news. Like, you know, Comic-Con had the audacity to be like the same week as we do the show. So I don't <laughs> appreciate that, you know. They should step well, out of the way. Yeah, we should get in touch with them about that. Yeah. So Amanda, we've been doing this show a year now. Yeah. What, wow. How, what does it feel like to be doing this show for a year? What what is it like? Like 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 what does it mean to you? What does this show mean to you? Is what I'm trying to ask. Um so it, this show has definitely been a force for good in my life. Um I think maybe the silliest benefit I've gotten from doing this show is that I I now don't think it's that hard to wake up at nine o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, like a normal adult human being with responsibilities. You know, I feel like that's a dig at me, but go ahead. No, no, no. It's a (laughs) dig at me. Like most people have things to do and they can't just sleep in all the time. Uh, So I'm, I'm now slightly incrementally more of a morning person, which is not a trivial accomplishment. Okay. So thank you for that. Thank you for being something I can look forward to doing in the morning. Right, right. Um, and then I would say that in general, I'm just reading. I'm just reading more all the time now. Like I'm reading. I'm caught up almost completely on my pull list. Like my backlog of things to read is much smaller, and that feels really good. Mm. Uh. When you approached me about this show, I think we were both feeling kind of guilty about all of the books we hadn't been reading. Right. I still feel guilty. But yes. <laughs> it's, but it's, it's such a horrible way to feel about your hobby. And I, I have a friend who I've recently gotten into um, reading comics. I, I bought him the first trade of a series. And now he's gone out and bought the rest of them. And I'm like, you're on the path towards darkness now. Once you feel guilty about the books you haven't read, then you'll truly be a comic book fan. (laughs) Uh, So, yeah, I mean, like, I feel better about the comic. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm like, I feel, I don't feel bad about not reading books because I feel like I'm going to get to all of them eventually. Right, right, right. Um, And then the last thing is I'm also realizing I've never really done a book club consistently before. And I've discovered with you that there are some books where their real value is the discussions you have with other people about them. And that there's a book that you might read and you have your personal experience with it and you're like, that's fine. But then when you can talk about it with someone else, it becomes a bigger part of your life. Right. And... I really appreciate that we have that. So thank you for all of those things. All right. So what do you think of your co-host? No, I'm, I kid. I, I joke. I joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, just for me, like, to be honest with you, I, I start this show selfishly. I, I try to approach these books as intellectually as possible. And, like, you know, it just wasn't a lot of that going around. Plus, you know, I wanted to do a show, and, like, I just couldn't find anyone to do a show with. And then I met you on the OG show of movies and stuff, right? And it was just like, oh, here goes a person. they like, come books like me. And, like, and like literally, I just wanted to start this show and get you on here, not because, you know, I just necessarily wanted to do a show. I just need someone to talk to about comic books with. Oh, I think that's all, that's all really awesome. It's like, um... When when you when you really like something in your own personal way and it feels like other people like it for different reasons, it can be a little lonely even in your even in your own hobby. Right. But here's the thing, right? 
what what I found is over the last this is not an insult, okay? Cuz cuz I'm talking about myself as well, right? Me and you have very similar personalities these, despite coming from completely different backgrounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like and like we might be just slightly snobbish. Just slightly. And I again, I'm not saying that as an insult, right? I'm not saying that as like a bad thing, right? But I was like, well, clearly she's smart and she can talk about these things in an intelligent way. You know what I'm saying? I was just like. Well, I'll, you're smart and you talk about these things in an intelligent way, do too. I, so do I, though? Do I? I, I you do. do. <laughs> Like it, it's hard to explain, but like it's nice to get out of that thing about who would win, like the Hulk versus Superman, just an example. When someone asks, like, 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 when a noob asks me that, I like, I don't really care, and they always say <laughs> I'm an unfun nerd, like, because like I, I don't, because like, oh, oh, you like this stuff? Well, how about this and that? I like, I don't care, like, I, I don't, like, I, I just, <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what to tell you. And I think one of the major benefits of the show is, is just that it's giving me like structure because, because, you know, I have to do this every couple of weeks. I've made that a habit for myself. And like I said, I like, like you said, I just read more and not just comic books. I'm, I've actually been reading like a, re- a lot of regular books lately. Awesome. Like I just got done reading the Berry Giant by, um, What's the guy named Ishiguro? He won like a Nobel Prize for for literature. Oh, like he he wrote um Never Let Me Go, and like I read that like a few years ago, and like I just read The Buried Giant, uh, which is like which is about post Arthurian England. Cool. And now I've I've just got done reading The Once and Future King. Which that yeah that I have not even thought about in a long time. How did you like it? Have, have you ever read it? Um, I did read it. Okay, so my story with that is, I've been trying to read this book since like since like the second X Men movie. Okay. And I can never get through it because there's one part in the in the book at the beginning when he's still when he's still like a kid when he's mm-hmm. still like warped, where like uh, him and Merlin get changed into a fish. And they go visit the basically the king of the moat around the castle, you know, Arthur grew up in, right? And the king of the moat gave this speech about power. And it was so magnificent, I, I couldn't finish the rest of the book. <laughs> and, like, because, like... You're I, like, I could go home now, I'm done. Yeah, yeah, and every time I try to read it, I get to this one part, because the first part of that book is, 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 is almost a kid's book, right? And, like, it's the first thing, and, like, just the way T.H. White describes him as, like, you can see all the malice, and, and you can see all the malice on his face, but you can see the malice and the sorrow and, and the hidden pain, like, of an absolute monarch. He says about power, like, power comes from the, from, from the nape of the neck. Like, love is an evolution, is a, is a trick played by evolution, and only might is right. And it was just, like, this, like, dope-ass speech about absolute power and like I, I i can't read the rest of this but <laughs> but after i got done reading the berry uh on the berry giant which actually has like sir gawain in it i was like you know what i need to give this another try and i'm gonna tell you something about on um, the once in future king there's a dark ass pitch black fucking book about human nature and nation building i i didn't i did not expect that for my king arthur story yeah i remember it not really being fun huh it's great. Like, 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 it's magnificent. Like, I can see why people love this book. And like, I, like, you know, it's one of those books where people say they love, but like, it's just the story about King Arthur. It might be the story about King Arthur, but why is it that this, this one particular book, you know what I'm saying? This one particular book about King Arthur is so damn, you know, it's so damn prominent. Mm-hmm. And then when you read it, you understand why. And you're just like, oh, this shit ain't about King Arthur at all. I mean, King Arthur's the main character, but this really ain't about Camelot and, like, knights and shit. This ain't really about no particular. This is, like, this ain't shit like Lord of the Rings. I, I was expecting, like, a Lord of the Rings quest type <laughs> story. This 
this is about human nature and, and like Arthur, like, look, I tell you like this, one of the things that struck me the most was when he told Lancelot and Guinevere about how, like, as a king, he has to lead by the example, by example, because he said, if, if the if the king is cruel, the people are cruel. And I'm like, oh, well, that seems very um, relevant. Relevant, yeah. So, like, he has to be absolute just, even if that means cutting off his wife and best friend's head. Then at the end of the book, he questions whether, you know, the, what is right, what is wrong, what is God trying to tell us. Maybe God doesn't exist. Maybe we're nothing. Maybe we're just, maybe we're just animals here for reproduction and none of this shit matters. And it's just, it's just, it's just this really dark thing. And I didn't expect that. But I'm only doing all this under that long ass tangent. It's because I'm doing this show. It just makes me want to read more. It makes me want to be more learned as, as, as it is. Not just comic books, but regular books also. I think after this, I'm going to read Mr. Avalon. So I'm, I'm, I'm on this big Arthur kick. That's awesome. Yes. I think it's really cool that you're sort of in like a little genre too. Because it, it helps you like make comparisons. Right, right. And you know that, you know, like when you get into... Like, I would take noir as an example. Like, if you're writing in that genre, you know that the writers are familiar with all of those stories, too. Uh-huh. So, like, you might kind of notice, like, the in-jokes or, like, the references and, and things that, like, just add to the story. Um, That's really cool. I'm glad we got to talk about the show. You know, so, uh, you know, and we also met a couple of, like, cool people doing this show, right? We, yeah. We, we've done a couple of interviews. We did uh, Matt Groom back in January, and we just did Eric Burnham uh, for Ghostbusters. Yeah, that was really exciting. That was, and, like, you know, hopefully we can do more stuff like that in the future. Hopefully. Yeah. So, Amanda, we are talking through the Woods by Emily Carroll. Now, could you please give us a synopsis of what we're reading? Uh, so this book is a collection, or I guess maybe an anthology, of, what would you say, like half a dozen short, very grim fairy tales. Super grim. Super grim. Um... I mean, I think maybe maybe that's a enough to start with. <laughs> right, right. So let's start with like like the epilogue, where it it's basically a framing device. It feels like where like uh, is that a boy or a girl reading in the dark with the lamp? I I don't think it matters. I think it's just um, like I think she's just opening the story with like. Because the um, there is a, a framing story at the end, and yeah. it feels like it feels like instead of this being like a complete story with the stories that you're reading in the middle, it feels more like this is just the first half or like the introductory sentence of a story. Mm, okay, but yeah, so you know, there's not much to read. There's not much to talk about that. You know, just it just it just sets the tone really. It just well. sets the tone really well. So, our neighbor house. Yes. That's the first story. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I, I like this book overall, mm -hmm. but I really think it starts high and kind of declines because I think this might be the best. As far as being just scary, I think this might be the scariest story in the book. Like, I don't think I don't think the other stories quite live up to this story, in my opinion. Is that because this is the one that's maybe the least explicit in terms of having, like, a monster? Right. Okay. That, that 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 has a lot to do with it. Then the fact, like at the end of it, is just like she gets caught anyway. Just the finality of it. You know what I'm saying? Mm hmm And and what she described without seeing is so horrifying, and you like never actually see it. And like, there's just something really scary about that. Um. Yeah. Right. So this is the story of the the three girls who live alone with their father. Right. And their father leaves and he says, if I don't come back, uh, you know, in, in a day or something, you need to go over to the neighbor's house so that you'll be safe. 
Um, and this is sort of like ambiguously in olden times. Right. All of all of these stories feel sort of vaguely Victorian. Right. And so each night after the, the fathers disappeared, each night a different one of the sisters um, disappears. And before she, she disappears, she says that she saw a man in a hat who smiled. Right? Right. And um, so she was like, the hell with this. She piss on her um. She pissed on her yeah, coat. So the, and we... the la- yeah, the last sister left decides to leave and go to the neighbor's house. And he's there waiting for them. Yeah. Waiting for her. So the question is, <coughs> excuse me, is was he always at the neighbor's house? Or was it just a futile gesture in general? And is, is there any allegory could we, could we like reach from this? Right. So this is also why I think this one might be... I agree with you. I, I found this story to be the most unsettling. Right. Um, in some of the other stories, there's like, and this isn't this is an aspect of some fairy tales. There's like an implied transgression, like people have done something wrong, and then something horrifying happens to them. This story is like. Three little girls did absolutely nothing. They're innocent. They're completely innocent. And we don't even really understand what's happening here. Like, is this a monster? Is this just their neighbor? Has it always been their neighbor? What happened to their father? Like, there is so much unknown here. And the fact that it's scary and unsettling is almost all on us. (laughs) Right, it's all implied for the most part. Yeah, yeah. She's inviting us to just make this as scary as we want. <laughs> huh. Okay, so the next one is A Lady's Hands Are Cold. Right. So this one is about, it seems, it seems this guy marry women and kill them. And his, and his, and his new wife Here's the voice of the old wife in the in the in the hall in the walls, basically. Yes. Is it, it, am, am I? Yep. And is that what's happening? Yes. So like at, at, like at one point it gets so bad she actually chops up the walls, and find pieces of this lady around the house. Yes. So. This one is probably the most explicit as far as like. As far as stories goes, because like it's almost a monster story, right? Yes. Like it's not even necessarily a ghost story; it's a, it's a monster story. And like when she pissed her back together, she immediately tried to attack her, but she ended up attacking the husband, if I'm not mistaken. And the girl runs. Am I missing something here? Like, um. Well, I thought so. There, there were two things that I thought were interesting. Um, it was, you know, so that, so I feel like the wife, the new wife had this sense of like, Oh, like her soul is unsettled. Like maybe if I put her body back together, she'll be like happy and at peace. And instead like the dead wife that she put back together was jealous and wanted to kill her. Just like a woman. Well, right. So, so it's it's interesting that like it was the new wife being naive, right? That was her undoing, and that she trusted this man in the first place and married him and came to this house without asking any questions, and then thought that she was just going to save the day or something, um, and that you know then the dead ex-wife actually you know comes for her instead. The other thing that I thought was really interesting was that. When I was little, I don't remember exactly how it went, but we used to tell like a scary story about a woman who had a red ribbon around her neck and that when you untied the ribbon, her head fell off. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like this was um, like a different version of that story that I'd already known. Okay. Um, it's, it's It's like a story little girls tell each other at slumber parties oh. um 
And then I also <clears throat> had the thought that the, the red ribbon is also a lot of times um, something that connects lovers like, if you remember, like, in Sandman, like, the, the fates had, like, the threads of people's lives. Right. I know that in, I think it's maybe <clears throat> some Japanese mythology, like, lovers are tied together with strings like that, and they're supposed to be red. So I wasn't, like, super into this story overall, but I really liked how she took, like, this red love ribbon element and, like, made it something a little bit new in in a way that felt natural right um so that was that was really like my favorite part of that story well um, I, I like it that she gets away thank god she yeah because most people in these stories don't get away she <laughs> actually got the hell on like she, yeah. she she was gone yeah so the next story is his face all red and yeah. this is basically a, a story of a brother killing another brother because he was jealous yep so what the hell is happening in this story, Amanda? Well, okay, so... I'm going to be asking that a lot. Yeah, so the the brother was... The, the jealous brother and the successful brother, I guess. Um, there, there's there been, like, a monster or an animal or something attacking their sheep. And so they, like, go out into the woods saying that they're going to kill it and they get out there and the the successful brother is like like everything that's scary in the woods the successful brother is like oh it's just a babbling creek oh the monster was really just a wolf but the jealous brother always sees it as something more right like he always sees it as something scary something threatening something supernatural and um the successful brother kills the wolf by himself and the jealous brother hides because he's scared. And, um, I guess he, he like can't really just take the shame of not having even helped kill the wolf. Um, and he's probably just sick of his brother at this point. And he, um, kills his brother and drops him into a hole, a suspiciously deep hole in the middle of the woods. Um, and the jealous brother goes back and he pretty much gets to take over his brother's life. Like he gets all the stuff his brother had. Um, the hot wife is like, oh my gosh, I'm so sad. Hug me. Um, all the people, all of his friends are consoling him. And, you know, he thinks he gets everything that he wanted. And uh, then like a week later, his brother just comes back and everyone's like, fine with this. Right. And so he has to sit there and be like, well, can I tell people that I killed my brother without admitting that I killed my brother? And no one's going to believe me. He's right there. Um, and at the very end, he goes and he checks the hole and there's still a body down there in the hole. And then the body opens his eyes. Yeah. And that's the end uh, of the story. So like my, my thing about these stories are this, I feel like there's a subtext or something that I'm missing in all of them. And okay. that may not be true, but this is how it feels. Like, you know, this story is actually, number one, I just want to say, like, in my mind, this is like, um, this is like an alternate story of, like, Gaston and Lil Fu. Like, Lil Fu <laughs> just get jealous of um, Gaston and kills him. And yeah. throw him in. Like, for some reason, that's the first thought that came in my mind when reading this. Because, again, it's, it's vaguely that era. That era. Yes. So, yes. like, you know, you, you have this bitch strong guy that everybody likes and, like, basically his dumpy sidekick. And like, oh, this is Gaston and LeFou. Oh, LeFou kills Gaston. So, to me, this is just, like, alternate, be- this is like alternate history for Billy and the Beast. Anyway. <laughs> no, I like that. So, like, yeah, it feel like I'm missing something. Like, what is this trying to say? Who is the guy that can't? They came out the woods, and, and if that guy is different, and if his dead brother is still down there, why did his dead brother open his eyes? What the hell is going on? I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, for me, I read this as a story about anxiety and mm. insecurity. So, like, I don't, like, I don't know, like, did he really kill his brother, or was he just, like, sick with anxiety and guilt and, you know, 
horrible, stressful feelings. Maybe, maybe the jealous brother just had like a psychotic break in the woods and life has actually been continuing on normally. And, you know, he's just imagining parts of this story. So I felt like this was, when I read this, I, because I am like an anxious person naturally, um, I took most of this as a manifestation of like the jealous brother's psychology and not really a horror story. Okay. Okay. So like there isn't really like a dead body in a hole in the woods. He climbed down there and that's just like what he sees. Ah, okay. But that there is very, very little in the actual story in the artwork or the dialogue. This story had very little dialogue actually. Um, There's very little in the story to explicitly have you read it that way. So I'm totally going to take the credit for being like, well, I'm like a crazy, insecure person over here, me as Amanda. And I totally have been walking through the woods and been like, oh, my God, is that a monster in a red hood? And like started running. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, Did I ever tell you my Blair Witch um, Project story? No. Do you so, know I'm from there? Really? The. um. Burkittsville is like right down the road from us. This is where they filmed it. Ah, uh, see any strange shit? What? <laughs> uh, constantly. This is Maryland. Well, <laughs> well, that, well, that might just be a crackhead. No, I, I joke. Um, so when, when that movie came out, I never seen it in the movie theaters, and like it was one of the movies you definitely should have seen in the movie theaters. Yes. <laughs> so, so I just ran it. And me and my two friends, my, two, my we watched it, and we just thought the shit was lame and wasn't scary at all. We watched the whole thing like, why the fuck is everybody like into this? This is not scary. This is kind of boring. So, and, and, and that's kind of what we walked away with. Now, where I grew up at, there was a lot of woods, and I might, may or may not have been out late coming from a girl house, maybe. I, maybe. I, I, I'm still scared to fully admit that, even though most people who was in, who, who 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 could who could whoop me is dead. Uh, <laughs> but like, um, I always used to cut through the woods. Like, like you know what I'm saying? Like, I need to get home. It, it, yeah. It, it's going on nine o'clock. I need to cut through the woods to get home. I've cut through these woods a million times, day or night. Right? I'm gonna tell you something, Amanda. That movie may not have been scary right then and there. Oh no. <laughs> but a week later, walking through the woods. At about nine o'clock at night, guess guess what happens to your imagination, Amanda? Just take a guess what happens to your imagination. Everything, <laughs> Every, everything happens. Everything. I think I might have ran out the woods early in the back of somebody's yard, as opposed to <laughs> a little path that would have brought me out right by my house. Like I had to jump somebody's fence because I just couldn't take it. Like every noise just had me paranoid. Like what the fuck? What was that? And it took me like a couple of months to ever like to go back to the woods, like to I could like settle myself. That's that's my story. Just like watching it didn't, didn't scare me at all. A week later, completely terrified because of that movie. Well, and I mean that's that's what this whole anthology is about. Is like don't go in the woods at night because there's scary stuff in the woods at night. The night is dark and full of terrors. Yes. We'll quote Game of Thrones. So our next story is my friend, what, Jana? Yeah. Yes. So this is about a girl and her friend being fake mediums yes. as a joke. And and then wanted to stop but didn't know how to stop. And kind of find out they're actually ghosts and, and, and they see, and like one friend can see them over the other. Right, right. So it was the... The friend who was just, like, next door banging on the walls pretending to be a ghost. Right. Uh, could actually see, like, a cloud around her friend and, you know, maybe actually was seeing ghosts. Well, th- this is what I took this as. I took this as them angering actual spirits. Like, that, that's why I took this as, like, I took this as, like, they were being punished for doing this, for doing this deception by actual spirits. Yes, I like that interpretation. Like you know, saying this is like some real raft, like like raft of God type shit going on here. Yeah. Yeah. 
So what do you think of this story? Um, I really liked it because you're talking about like, like the girls being sort of punished for having pretended to be mediums and be able to see ghosts. Um, that aspect of like retribution made me look back at the stories I had already read and ask myself, are all of these stories about some sort of like retribution for a moral failing? Right. Because a lot of like a lot of fairy tales do have that like, like, Bad things only happen to you if you make a mistake, if you do something wrong. A lot of them are cautionary tales. And I was like, ooh, I was like, this may be like the thing that I need to understand all of these stories. This specific story was like not my favorite, though. It no, just it just no. helped me read. I think it helped me read the other stories better. Right. I agree. I, I agree. Um, it's probably the weakest of the stories, definitely. But but it does. It's, it's like Thor the Dark World. Um it, it, it means nothing by itself, but it, taking it as a whole is really important. I have one question I wanted to ask you, though. Okay. Um, about this story, which was we have – we're mostly in the point of view of I, – I called her like the friend next door who's just like banging on the walls. Right. And she saw her other friend as being haunted and as that girl was like slowly going crazy and obsessive and like this ghost was like – feeding off of her and driving her crazy. Do you think that her friend saw the same thing happening to her the whole time? Oh, wow. I never, because at the very end she turns around and it's, it wasn't quite clear to me which girl it was. Well, no, that's the friend because the other girl, she disappeared, right? She like vanished. Well, yeah. So there she goes out, looking for Jana and then she finds her and she turns around. Yeah, I guess that is still her. I guess that was just that part at the end was just a little bit ambiguous to me about no, um, which girl they were looking for and who it was. And it made me think I was like, maybe, maybe what was driving them crazy a little bit was that they were both watching each other being haunted like this. I think that's, I think that's a very good because at the end it's the friend Yvonne that turns around with the ghost around her. Also, it could be just that they, maybe the ghost is just hopping from person to person. I don't know, but that's actually a good interpretation of that, um, of what was going on. So you got anything else to say about the story, Amanda? Um, no. All right. So let's move to the next one. The longest story in this book, the nesting place. Mm-hmm. Now this one, I don't even know what the hell kind of story this is. I'm not even for sure. It, it's it's almost vaguely sci-fi. Yeah. Like like I, like there's strong vibes of evading of the body snatchers in this story, right? Mm-hmm. So what did you think of this one? What what did you take away from from this story? Um. So I feel like. I feel like of all of the stories in the book, this is the one that most has a plot. Right. Where if someone was like, oh, tell me what this is about, what this thing you're looking at is about, I'd be like, oh, well, there's this story, and it's like Victorian times, and it's like this little girl who's like sick has to be sent out to the country with her family because like her dad died or something, and like the the pretty young wife is actually like secretly a bag full of worms and she wants to like steal the little girl's body and like take over the world with her worm babies. And people would be like, Whoa, that sounds super weird. And I'd be like, yeah, it's really creepy and the art's beautiful. You got to check it out. So like, I feel like this is the, this is like maybe like a good pitch story for her, but it's not like emotionally the strongest one in the book. It's not, but th- this is why I say, where, where the, I, I guarantee you she was heavily influenced by Invading Other Body Snatchers. Have you ever seen the the 1970s version of Invading Other Body Snatchers and how that ends? I don't think I have. Okay, so I'm about to spoil it for you if you don't mind. Thank you. I don't so, mind at all. Okay, so that movie stars Donald Sutherland. And, and again, it's, it's the story about these people trying to evade these aliens taking over the planet, right? 
And at the end, the main character, which is Don Sullivan's character, he escapes, or at least you think he does. Then the last story, then, then the last scene is of the other, like not necessarily the other lead, yeah, yeah, of the other lead. And she's like, "Oh my God, it's you!" Then he opened his mouth and starts screaming in the alien, ter- in, in the alien like pitch, and mm-hmm. the, and the story goes off, and like right. the movie ends. So it ends like it ends messed up, as in like basically hum- humanity is lost. If the main characters got taken over at the end, the humanity is lost. That's basically yeah. what that happens at the end of this story. Yeah, I I think um, I mean like a lot of horror stories end that way. Right, it's very Twilight Zoney in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that is a really great comparison. Is this this all of this does feel Twilight Zoney? Mm. Little little open ended stories that are supposed to make you think. Um, but are, are like, they're just like little nuggets. They're not a complete thing on their own. Right. And they're all sort of like spiritually related, but they're not, there's no continuity. Mm -hmm. Um, like, I think horror just leads itself well to like anthology type things. Yeah, absolutely. In general. Um, it's also, go ahead. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was going to say that a lot of – sometimes a lot of art is just knowing when to stop. Right. And, you know, being able to put together half a dozen really tight, really well-made short stories is way better than having any one of these stories being padded and just, like, made longer for no reason. Right. So, like, I, I – and I feel like – um, especially with like things like photography, people will take like thousands and thousands of photos and then they only show you the best one. Well, yeah, I know a little bit about that. Yeah, exactly. So like, <laughs> like this is, this is the, sometimes horror is like that. Like people come up with like 50 different scary premises and then sometimes they make the mistake of taking one and trying to make like 30 movies out of it. Or you can take each of those 50 premises and just give them enough attention. Right. So, yeah, I mean, there's not really much to say. I mean, there's a lot to say. It's just like, what do you think the worms are that inhabiting these bodies? Because I do think, well, not necessarily mostly a resident, resident. It's something really creepy about like, like the face disappearing is just full of worms. Yes. Um, It was super creepy. I don't really, I don't really have a clear idea of what they are. I did feel like, I did, I I feel like part of what made it creepy for me was that it felt like it wasn't like one organism, that it was like this collection of worms became like a person because they were like close together sort of like a collective consciousness thing right or or maybe more like a hive of bees like they're all working towards the same goal but like each individual worm would just be like a stupid violent animal right which is kind of scary like anything that doesn't not anything but um Uh, organisms that don't think the way humans do are inherently scary and confusing because we don't understand them. Right, right, right. So at the end of this story, the girl goes off to the hospital and kind of mm-hmm. find out her brother is also a worm person. Yeah. Do we think he was always a worm person or do we think that in like the last scene she got him? I, I don't know. Like, 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 that's the thing. I'm not for sure. And, like, like I've been thinking about this, like, since I've read it. I was like, uh, could it be? Maybe. But, like, I'm not quite for sure. It does seem like she didn't notice anything weird about her brother until the end. So maybe out of desperation, she might have did it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was also thinking, like, that adds kind of an extra horror element to it because the the girl was sick and the young wife as the monster was like, I'm going to, you know, take your body and put my babies in you. And 
she manages to convince the monster that she doesn't really want to take her body and leave and take over the world because the world sucks so much. Right. Like the world is dark and scary and the smoke is so bad that it like bites you maybe literally. And she was like, no, if you go to the city, the city is evil. Like the city is what made me like sad and depressed and sick. Like you'll just go there and die. Like the world is so horrible that you don't want to leave they, here. Then like if they find out about you, they, they, they're going to do experiments on you and kill you because that's right. You... Right. She, she, she's essentially, and, and I mean like, she's like a depressed little girl, maybe not without, reason right and she's just sort of like i'm going to use my oppressive sadness as a defensive weapon here and it kind of works right or does it dun 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 no Um. well yeah yeah exactly but um i found that kind of i found that kind of scary because i had kind of been accepting of this girl as just like a sad, moody little girl who likes to read, which is a very common character. Right. And it hadn't really occurred to me that this girl, just through the course of her normal life before she even got to the monsters, was probably, like, horrifically traumatized and, like, super depressed and suicidal. Right. Um, And so it was, like, getting to the climax of this horror story that made me, like, more horrified for the girl retrospectively again. So it kind of like reframed things. Um, And so the monster wasn't really scary for me. It was the realization I was like, Oh, this girl probably like most of the time just. And somehow found like the strength to use that as a weapon in this particular situation. Right. Um, Anyways. uh, So let's. Let's move on to the final story, which is basically more or less a retelling of Little Red Riding Hood. It doesn't even have a title. It just says in conclusion. Right. So this is supposed to be like like the second. This is, this is why I said like the framing story. It wasn't really like like a, like the same story. Right. It was more like she thought of the beginning of a story and put that at the beginning of the book. And then she thought of the way a story might end and put it at the end. Right. But didn't um, necessarily, like, need it to be the same beginning and end, maybe? Because mm. we, we know the beginning of Little Red Riding Hood, right? We do. So we didn't need to rehear that part. So, um, yeah, yeah. Although there is, when you look at the little, the I guess it would be Little Red Riding Hood, in bed, she does have the lamp on her bedpost, like, at the beginning of the story. Oh, she do- I didn't even notice that. So maybe this is just supposed to be the same kid on, like, a different night. Right, okay. Right, okay, yeah, that makes that makes a lot more sense. Okay, cool, cool. So um, she basically um, walked through the woods and make it to her father's house. But apparently the big bad wolf is waiting for her to walk back. Yes. And um, what he says is really chill. And he's like, you have to be lucky. Like, 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 you have to be lucky every time that to see me. I just have to be lucky once to find you. Yeah. And that was kind of chilling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, there's, there's not much to say about this story. I, I think that wraps up this. Um, Amanda, would you recommend this book to people um oh yeah absolutely i was actually gonna say i thought that the um the wolf's last line was actually kind of about the book in general which is that like when you're reading this book to get through it without being scared you have to be lucky every single story ah but the writer as the wolf only has to be lucky once for you to think it's good (laughs) Oh, wow. You see, now, I like that. I like that. Like, I'll... she's the wolf, and she only has to scare you once. I... Uh, you have to make it through all of the stories. So, look, let me tell people. Me and Amanda text, me and Amanda text each other a lot. Like, 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 not every day, but we text each other a lot. So, like, I'm reading this, and I just text her, what the hell do you have me reading? <laughs> 
No, yeah. actually, I think I told you first. I was like, this is really good. Yeah. Because we had we had no idea what this was. This was recommended by um, this was recommended by a listener. Right. And I was just like, what do you have me reading, Amanda? Like, I, I work overnight in an empty build in, with a bunch of <laughs> empty buildings with long, dark hallways. And you got me reading this scary shit. Why would you do this to me? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just long, just, just just a bunch of long, dark hallways and like, and like areas that ain't been used in like a year or two. And like, uh, oh, man. This. So this book I read during the day after I got off work. That's that's when I read this book. As of the first couple of stories, like, nope. <laughs> Not yeah, today. I definitely I definitely um I definitely didn't go in our basement at night for like a couple days. I left I left my laundry down there until the morning because I didn't want to go get it at night. <laughs> you know, Amanda, you, you know we like we we're, we're like grown people in our mid thirties, right? <laughs> well, but see that's the thing, is that when you're a little kid and you're like, oh, I don't want to go in the basement, your parents can be like, oh, it's fine. But, like, your parents didn't have to go in the basement if they didn't want to, you know? Right. <laughs> like, when you're an adult, no one has to know that you're scared. But we just admit to everybody that we were. So. <laughs> it makes us it makes us relatable. That's that's right. That's because right. otherwise we're perfect. We're, we're perfect, exactly. awesome, amazing people. And the one problem we have is that sometimes we're scared of the dark. Exactly. I sleep with a nightlight. And so, <laughs> Amanda, we, I guess it's my turn to choose the book we'll read next week. Uh, yeah, that's that's how the rules of sharing go. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. Um, so for next episode, not next week, because we do this every two weeks, we are reading The Flintstones from 2016, I believe. Okay. And we're reading issue one through 12. I feel like when you said that, I feel like I needed like a radio DJ sound effect. Oh. Like I wish I could have hit a button and had like the running in place to get the car, the the foot powered like car started. (laughs) Like the. Oh, no, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. This book is written by Mark Russell. It came out, it, it started in 2016, ended. 2017 and apparently this version of Flintstones is very very woke as the kids say it's very woke I heard so that's what we are reading in a couple of weeks I'm actually really excited about this I'm I'm also really excited about this too because I'm in a great mood so I'm going to be excited about everything that's great that's great Uh, (laughs) just know next week um, intro music would definitely be the Flintstones theme so no you you did not download the wrong podcast that actually is the Flintstones theme that you're hearing I'm telling you now (laughs) so Amanda what could they reach us Uh, we are on Twitter as comic book club 52 They could email us, comicbookclub52 at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook as The Comic Book Club. And you can also, if you follow me or Jamil personally, you can also reach out to us. That's how we got this recommendation. Um, So, yeah, all of that works. Um, Flag, semaphore, smoke signals. We'll get there eventually. Mind you. Um, Amanda is way more popular on Twitter than I am. I think I got like 15 followers. So, you know, you following me, you, you, you're you not going to see much. So, so direct all your, um, all of your recommendations towards Amanda Combe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, I am Jamil Payne. I am Amanda Combe. <laughs> and we are out. Too.